সতেরো সাল থেকে আর আর সার্ভিসে আছি আমি থেকে হ্যাঁ মাঝে কিছুদিন ট্রান্সফার হয়ে এবিএন সিল কলেজ আর কিছুদিন গোয়ালতোর কলেজে প্রিন্সিপাল হিসেবে দু বছরের মতন ছিলাম আর আমাদের একটা হোস্টেলের এক্সপানশন হয়েছে বিদ্যাসাগর হোস্টেল সেটা ওনার সময় হয়তো ছিল না ওটা চওড়া রাস্তা হয়ে গেছে একদম ডাইরেক্ট লোধা সুলি পর্যন্ত কানেক্ট করছে বম্বে রোডেতে কানেক্ট করছে এবং ওই রাস্তা ধরেই স্যার আপনার ওই দশ বারো কিলোমিটার গেলে পরে ওই জিতু সোলেতে ওখানে আমাদের নতুন ইউনিভার্সিটি সাধু রামচান্দ মুর্মু ইউনিভার্সিটি ওইখানটা হয়েছে ও এই বছর থেকে আলাদা ইউনিভার্সিটি চালু হবে Sir, may I start now? Yeah. Yes, yes, start. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. This is our second day. We are continuing the webinar, DVD sponsored. Uh, we all know that how we are entangled in this COVID situation. And we are all about worried about the different types of vaccines, the first dose, second dose, whatever it may be. But, Sound one thing, but one thing I can say that without uh, analyzing or sequencing the structure of genetic structure of the virus, it is not possible to develop any kind of vaccines. That's why it is very important uh, that, that today's title and today's theme of the lecture. Without further delay, I would now request our honorable principal sir dr devnarayan rai jhargram raj college to inaugurate today's sessions with his welcome speech sir good afternoon to all respected professor somitra das director national institute of biomedical genomics kollani professor subir das gupto respected principal of different government colleges and government aided colleges other dignitaries, academic luminaries, esteemed colleagues from different institutions, my dear students, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Office of the Principal, Teachers Council, Internal Quality Assurance Cell, Non-Teaching Staff, Student Council of Jhargam Raj College, and also my personal behalf, I heartily welcome you in the Jhargam Raj College. The Jhargam Raj College started its journey as Jhargam Agricultural College in 1949. The government of West Bengal took over the college in 1953 and was affiliated to the University of Calcutta. The college is now affiliated to Vidyasagar University since 1985. Presently, Jhargam Raj College is one of the most prestigious government college in the district of Jhargam which engages in educating the first generation learners from the socially and economically backward community and from the tribal families. There are total 15 departments in our college. The Department of Chemistry, Geology, and Bengali offers postgraduate since 2005. There are also two boys hostel and one separate girls hostel, making our college a partially residential campus. The college as a whole caters to more than 3,000 students. A large number of UG students are able to secure first class in the university examination and quite a few number of students qualify JAM, NET, SET, GATE, equivalent 
national level competitive examinations to pursue higher studies in various national and international institutes of repute in every year. In the year 2019, our college came under prestigious DBT Star College scheme offered by Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. In 2020, we achieved Educational Excellence Award conferred by G. Chobis Ghanta. In the same year, we get an honor to extend more than 4,000 online courses to 3,000 enrolled participants through Coursera Organization of United States of America at free of cost with pass out certificate. Our zoology department, marked as one of the best departments, not only in West Bengal, but also in our country. The Department of Geology was started its journey in the year 1971. In the year 2006, we have started post-graduation course, Jhargam Raj College graduates, along with many other successful persons who spent their formative years here, have gone on to make extraordinary contributions to the science as scientists, researchers, teachers, and intellectual leaders all over the country as well as international platform. It is a great historical moment for us that our postgraduate department of geology is going to organize a series of exciting and resourceful advanced web lecture series for the benefit of the teachers and students all over the country. The topic of the lecture today is Genomics of SARS-CoV-2. This is the 37th webinar workshop program and second program of this year of our college. We hope this webinar is very much pertinent to present situation. Actually, we do not know after how many days we will be able to overcome the present pandemic situation of COVID-19. We also do not know after how many days the normals begin in our society. I hope the deliberation of our honorable speaker is not only enrich our knowledge, but also boost up the mental strength of our participants. Last but not the least, our honorable speaker, Professor Shomitto Das, is a very energetic, dynamic, enthusiastic, soft-spoken person engaged in various activities in the domain of academic atmosphere. He did a lot of outstanding work in the field of genomics. We are really grateful to him. With this, I once again express my heartfelt gratitude to our honorable speaker, Professor Das, for sparing his invaluable time with us. I wish a grand success of the program. Thank you very much. Ajkere Onushthane, Uposthit, Shakol Gani Guni Bektitto, Tatha Amade Manonio speaker ke, Ami Antori Bhave Shodha Pronam Janachi, Ebong Amra Ajke Loko Kurichi, Je Ajke Amade Seminare, Dushor Opor, Bortomani participant Onsu Gohun Kurichin, Amade Gotokal Pujunto Amade, a Google Sute Renewal Erector Shamosa Chilo, Tamra Buzdi Perichilam, J. A. Seminata. A webinar actually amon at a level of the cholech, Jeshekani Amade, a renewal immediate Google suited provision. So Ajke Amra, two fifty participant allow Kote Parvo, direct Google meter Mudde. Jara Estin, Shokolke, Aregbar College, Pokote, Shodha Janai, Shabai Halo Thakun, Susto Thakun, Ebong Amra Loko Kurichi, the base Kichudin Dhori. আমাদের কলেজেতে বিভিন্ন দেশের এবং বিদেশের অনেক জ্ঞানী গুণী বিদগ্ধ মানুষ তারা বিভিন্ন ওয়েবিনারতে বক্তৃতা দিয়ে যাচ্ছেন কদিন আগেই আমরা যাদবপুরের প্রফেসর অফিসার শ্রমিক গুহর কাছ থেকে আমরা মলিকুলার মেশিনের উপর শুনেছি অনেক কিছু অনেক কিছু জেনেছি আমরা আশা করছি পরপর আমরা এই ধরনেরই কিছু কিছু ওয়েবিনার আমরা করতে পারব যাদ্বারা আমাদের ছাত্র ছাত্রীরা অনেকটাই মানসিকভাবে মনের জোর পাবে এবং এই কোভিড সিচুয়েশনে যে নরমাল সি আমাদের ক্লাস টিচিং এ চলে গেছে সেই অবস্থায় অনেকটা মনের জোর পাবে আপনারা বারে বারে আসুন যারা এসছেন এই অনুষ্ঠানে অংশ গ্রহণকারী সকলকেই আরেকবার আন্তরিকভাবে শ্রদ্ধা কৃতজ্ঞতা 
प्रणाम जानिए आजकल अनुष्ठान शुभ सूचना कर स्पर्शे कलेज समृद्ध हक छात्र छात्री समृद्ध हक एवं अनुष्ठान सर्वांगीन साफल्य कमना कर शुभ सूचना घोषणा कर सबा भलो थकूँ सुस्थान कोड विधि मे चलू हमें खूब द्रुत स्वाभाविक जीवने फिर आसब सबा भलो थक thank you sir for your inspiring words that will help us to continue our legacy of our institutions now i request uh, our dvt coordinator dr tapos kumar adoldar assistant professor from the department of chemistry uh, to share his thoughts about this dvt program as well as i will request him to formally introduce our eminent speaker professor das tapos thank you sanjeev for giving me this opportunity actually if i have to say something i must say that dbt star college scheme is very much prestigious for a college like jhargam raj college and during last two year we have tried our level best to organize various program for the benefit of student but due to pandemic situation we are not able to organize any workshop any seminar or invited lecture physically however i have wrote to professor das on 22nd of february 2020 to come over our college and to interact with our student but due to the present pandemic situation he was not able to come and then just last month i again wrote to him if he give his valuable consent to deliver at least a virtual lecture for our student it will it will be very very beneficial for them with this few word now i am taking this opportunity to introduce our honorable speaker professor das professor das by training he is a microbiologist and more precisely he is a one of the leading figure in molecular virologist virology currently he is working as an professor of microbiology and cell biology iisc bangalore and now he is working as an director of national institute of biomolecular genomics colony and he is also coordinating indian sars cov2 genomic consortium the main agenda of this consortium is to surveillance the sequ genome sequence of sars cov2 professor das our proud he is a native of jhargam he studied kumut kumari institution jhargam during the year 1972 to 1977 he did his phd from indian institute of chemical biology kolkata and received his phd degree from calcutta university his phd work was on host pathogen interaction after that professor das moved to university of california los angeles in the year 1992 and after that he joined as an assistant research virologist in the year 1994 and there he identified rna from yeast has some kind of anti viral activity against polio and hepatitis c 
and based on his work the ucla has started a company named virazim then he moved to india in the year 1998 and started his independent research career his main focus of his research is hepatitis c virus he has the instrumental role in developing hepatitis c vaccine he has pioneered the molecular virology research in our country he has filed almost 10 patent he has published almost more than 1000 of research paper in national and international journal of reputy he wrote one book chapter several review and 22 conference proceedings his total citation is over 3000 with age index 31 he is currently guiding 10 phd student and five postdoc he has produced 20 phd already from his lab and guided 11 bookshop and numerous project assistant he has elected as fellow of all the three major science academy of the country in the year 2009 he became the elected fellow of indian academy of sciences bangalore and in the same year he also elected as the fellow of indian academy in sorry national academy of sciences and in the year 2012 he became the indian national science fellow of indian national science academy he received numerous award and accolades in 2005 he received national bioscience award one of the most prestigious award in our country in the field of biology in the year 2010 he received nasty reliance platinum jubilee award in the year 2012 then he received ranboxy research award and in 2014 he received sir jc bose fellowship from department of science and technology government of india he is a member of various scientific bodies like american society of virology american society of microbiology with this small introduction i would like to request professor das to start his presentation professor das thank you khub bhalo lagche bahu din por pray 45 bochor por jhargam raj college er shonge jukto hote pere ami eto somosto dr tapos bollo kintu ami ekta kothai bolbo kobi guru bhashay mon naam shudhu ei bole khato hok ami tomader dilo so anyway it's a great pleasure to be here uh, as i told you that last year i think around uh, february he um, tapas contacted me to have a presentation i mean at uh, to, for a visit for jhargam raj college but it so happened because of the pandemic i could not make it and uh, now we never anticipated but this will last for so long can you see my slides can one of you confirm can you see my yes, slides yes sir yes sir okay right so it's a great pleasure uh, finally that at, at the uh, occasion of your star college webinar i could participate in some activity of jhargam raj college as dr tapos mentioned rightly i am a student of ekai uh, in 1977 madhyamik batch and then i moved to st xavier's and then uh, pursued my career all through your hard i think uh, i i actually got updated my cv from dr tapos looks like i don't know much about me but looks like he has done a bunch of homework before introducing thank you uh, so you know uh, as he mentioned rightly that i am a professor at the indian institute of science last 22 year 23 years now but uh, from 2018 onwards i am actually heading this national institute of biomedical genomics which is in kalyani and uh, closely working for west bengal as well and representing lot of work 
from West Bengal at the national level. So, as uh, you know, all of you know that we are going through a very difficult time, and we are trying to somehow comprehend, somehow negotiate, somehow compromise, and then move on with the life. Uh, there are a lot of struggle. Everybody is suffering at different levels, but uh, definitely we need to move on. And uh, this kind of lectures will probably help you to know more uh, about this virus and more uh, more about this pandemic and uh, you know be alert so that in future we are actually much more prepared to handle even worse situation so you know most of you are aware that all these threats that we are having in last decade are from rna viruses starting from h1n1 the swine flu then dengue every year it comes back you have chikungunya you have flu all the time the the regular flu you have common cold all of these are for rna virus now why it is so difficult to handle the rna virus is a major question and bothering all of us so the main thing that the rna virus becomes so difficult to handle is because of its high mutation rate and that happens because the virus actually when it copies its genome it uses an enzyme called rdrp rna dependent rna polymerase but that lacks proofreading activity so even if it copies but it cannot copy correctly if it makes a mistake that mistake stays back and that actually which we call a mutation and that changes the genetic setup of the viruses and that leads to generation of quasi species from one species you make different variants which we call quasi species now this error rate is at the limit of the mutation tolerability but you have to remember depending on the genome the virus has some capacity to absorb those mutation it cannot absorb a uh, unlimited number of mutations then the virus won't be able to sustain it so the principle for usage of drugs like rivavirin and remdesivir are just to push them for doing more mistakes so essentially we try to cross those virus the threshold of the mutation so that they are now making more and more mutations as they are not able to tolerate that number of mutations then those viruses can be actually stopped replication so you know when we talk about the mutation rate is very high how high is actually we consider it very high if you just check it in the rna virus like dengue virus influenza virus hiv1 virus you can see this is the mutation rate compared to bacteria and you can see compared to fungi and the protozoa so rna virus somehow is top of the list and within the rna virus also there is a bunch of viruses something like orthomyxo virus which which comprises of this h5n1 which is an avian flu h1n1 human flu zika virus dengue virus west nile virus these are all flaviviruses chikungunya virus these are all uh, or even polio virus polio virus is little lesser they are at a very very high rate of mutations now if you go back charles darwin once commented that the variability is not actually caused by man he only unintentionally expose organic being to new conditions of life and then nature acts on the organization and causes it to vary so essentially all these mutations that virus does one thing is definitely sure i told you that rdrp that rna dependent rna polymerase does not have the proofreading activity and that's how it is error prone but at the same time we also continually push them under some kind of a selection pressure and because of that they try to evade and they tend to mutate so that ends up you know we know from the bacteria it ends up in the drug resistance for the virus also it can actually escape the antiviral treatment and the variations in the antigenic epitope so if you have a vaccine made and the virus cannot really now infect because of the vaccine virus will tend to 
modify itself so that it can escape the vaccine. That's precisely now the what is something that we have been reading in the newspaper all the time. Now coming back to the RNA virus and the how we handle it. The RNA virus genome can actually keep changing in different ways. When it changes in a small way, like one or two mutations, we call it's an antigenic drift. Means there is a minor changes in the epitopic uh, antigenic region, and that's how the virus behaves a little different. But when there is a major change, we call it's an antigenic shift. And it's and both of them can actually be observed in influenza virus. Seasonal influenza always have antigenic drift. Every year there will be a mutation. But sometimes, like this H1N1 came out from the swine flu, is actually a combination of antigenic shift because of the genome got interchanged. A lot of times the virus actually ended up infecting in the same host. And in that cell, actually they can interchange their segments. And that's how they ended up with a different genome altogether. You can see the blue and the red, they interchange and it becomes a combined genome. And that genome is quite different from the blue or from the red. Also, there are examples of recombination, like an unsegmented RNA genome can be recombined. Then, you know, retroviruses, you know, that gets integrated into the genome. And there are segmented RNA virus, as I told you, they can actually change their segment and make it into a different virus. So the increase in the rate of beneficial genetic variants the new combinations from the existing mutants that can happen. And all these things complicates the whole RNA virus biology. Now, talking about the RNA virus in general, the virus actually enters, which we call, uh, there is a gate man at the gate. The virus actually goes and drives the gate and enters into that. And once it enters, the virus, if it is an RNA virus, the RNA gets translated makes the protein and those proteins are then helps the virus to replicate from if it is a positive strand then it makes a negative strand and then the negative strand used as an intermediate and used for more and more template for making more and more positive strand and finally the virus actually assembles and egresses out but all these methods or these uh, steps involve a lot of protein protein or RNA protein interactions. So there are viral and the host protein that is continuously crossed off. The virus might infect a host, but may not be successful if they cannot really have real way of exploiting the host and be successful to win over the host. Many a times virus actually, uh, we are able to win over the virus and virus cannot really establish any infection in the host. So it's not that any time you are exposed to a virus, you will be always infected. That's you have to keep it in mind. So what we call this is the host factor. And the host factor are the key determinants of the viral pathology and the evolution. Even now, you can see people are getting infected with the coronavirus or our COVID or SARS coronavirus too. But the extent of infection extent of severity, mild, moderate, severe, it's different from individuals to individuals. And that's precisely happening because of the crosstalk between the virus and the host factor. So remember, what we say host factor is essentially could be the RNA, could be the protein, could be some other elements within the, vir uh, within the host that protects the viral RNA replication in the infected. So, you know, our lab at Indian Institute of Science, uh, I'm still continuing there. So we worked on hepatitis C virus for the last 22 years. And we showed that hepatitis C virus, something like it runs an orchestra, where there are several host factors are actually doing different roles. There are proteins like HUR, there are proteins like PTB, which can you can imagine like a flute. You have the drum, which is a lab protein. There are several micro RNAs and lately we have shown a long non-coding RNA, micro RNA, all of them joined the orchestra with the tune of hepatitis C virus so that it's actually a hijacking situation. Virus infects the host. These proteins, they 
forget about their own responsibility of their work they come and started helping the virus and they bind to the 5 prime utr or the 3 prime utr and helps the virus replication helps the virus to establish infection and cause the pathogenesis this is something is very very difficult to understand and over the years i'm not talking about my work so just one slide to show that in my lab at iisc what we did we try to understand that what are the steps are critical for the virus for hepatitis c virus and you know hepatitis c virus got the nobel prize last year and now it's in the limelight but it is otherwise a silent killer many a times it has actually crossed affecting more than the hiv infected people we showed that the viral rna translation can be inhibited by a small rna or a peptide uh, you know all these things are actually now patented and we are trying to commercialize those to have an antiviral against hepatitis c virus not only that we were actually running a center for excellence for hepatitis c virus research in, in india and government of india somehow encouraged us to explore for the some herbal where we are actually rich in the country and we showed from our lab that from the pomegranate which all of you are actually having pomegranate juice we have some purified compound like punicaline and punicalazine which can effectively inhibit the viral replication and we are in the news for a long time and now we are actually trying to team up with the dabbers research foundation to see whether we can actually make it something which will be a hepatoprotective in addition to the uh, hepatocellular carcinoma to as an antiviral treatment for hepatitis c virus we also showed from phylantha samaras we call it bhumi amla there is a compound called phylanthin and karilazin which actually can inhibit the virus replication and uh, we also showed that there are monoclonal antibodies from the infected patient isolated those cloned them and we demonstrated that this monoclonal antibody can be used to stop the virus replication we also made a vlp based vaccine which we are now testing it in pig as a part of the pre clinical trial before we go into the next phase and all these molecules are being tested in mice now unfortunately hepatitis c virus does not infect mice so what we have adopted we have collaborated with a uh, lab in japan they have mice which actually harvests human hepatocytes it's a transplanted hepatocytes in the mice now this mice depends on the human liver so because it depends on the human liver if you infect with hepatitis c virus this mice can be infected so in this chimeric or humanized mice we showed that if you have this infection and you use this molecules that we have discovered and patented from our laboratory you can actually reduce the virus titer which gives you a promise that this could be one of those targets which we can exploit to develop future antiviral coming back to today's topic on the new challenges and the coronaviruses the coronaviruses are nothing new it's been there for a long time but new sars coronavirus is in cov or sars coronavirus 2 is something which is much more worrisome all this coronavirus you have an envelope protein you have a membrane you have the spike protein as you been hearing all the time i say that i have learned much more from the whatsapp university or in the newspaper in last one year that than what i have learned all these years from textbooks so you know everybody knows more than me now because everybody is informed everywhere and unfortunately sometimes the informations are not correct but anyway all of you should have heard that there is a spike protein which actually interacts with the ac2 receptor i will come to that so now the thing is this virus is 30 kg you know i told you rna virus the main problem is the number of mutations its mutation rate is very very high unfortunately longer the genome lesser is the mutation rate so it can't really accommodate too many mutations if you really see majority of the mutations that you are getting reported are actually in the spike or in the some nucleocapsid regions but in the rda smaller rna virus actually these mutations can happen across the genome in everywhere right so that is the only positive sign of having a little longer rna genome in this case now sars cov2 is a novel coronavirus it does not have an active adaptive immune response that means we are actually not haven't seen this pathogen before our artillery doesn't really understand how to handle this particular enemy 
So coronaviruses are known to shut down the interferon secretory pathway, thereby overcoming the innate immune response. So what we call that artillery is actually our innate immunity. So any time, any time when we are actually exposed to a pathogen, our innate immunity defends us. But in case of coronavirus infection, since it actually somehow manipulates the innate immunity, somehow we are not able to give a real fight against this particular virus. Now what happens, the virus, as I told you, the spike protein binds to a C2, but many times the virus infects one host and then maybe some intermediate host, which it's not supposed to infect. If it infects there, it undergoes mutation. And after that mutation, it can modify it in such a way, it can actually infect a wider range of hosts. So as I told you in the beginning, there could be factors like antigenic shift, antigenic drift, and the recombination. And all these things can happen in an intermediate host. And because of this intermediate host, we sometimes ended up with a virus which we never expected to encounter in the lab. And in, in, in general, what happens now, it has an accessory receptors, which may aid in more infectivity. It might have a receptor, it might have a, a, a modifications, which will have more affinity towards the host receptor, make it more infective to this. And as precisely is happening for the SARS coronavirus. So the natural host is in one, on, one scenario, it goes to an intermediate host, gets a changed or a completely makeover change, and then it goes to uh, infecting the human host. Coming just back to the story of this pandemic, as uh, Tapos was referring, uh, these things happened, uh, we discussed in February, but just little before that, 31st of December, it was initially reported in WHO China that there is a cluster of mutations in form, and 7 January, they actually reported that this, uh, they have identified a new type of coronavirus because they discovered or they reported that the 15th healthcare practitioners in Wuhan hospital were confirmed to have infection from this particular new or novel coronavirus. Now, although most of the human coronavirus infection, as I told you, it's not very new. Earlier also there were coronavirus. We also have faced the Middle East respiratory syndrome coronavirus or MERS virus, but that have caused more than 10,000 cumulative cases in the past two decades with a mortality rate of 10% for SARS coronavirus and 37% for the MERS coronavirus. But this particular virus at that time it was alerted looks like little different from what we have faced in the past. Coming back to this coronavirus, this as I told you, it goes inside the cells by receptor mediated endocytosis. And the spike protein is the one which helps to bind to the SCT receptor, goes inside the endosomes, and in that endosomes, it, uh, membrane fusion, the genomic RNA released. This genomic RNA is then translated and then makes the two proteins. One is RF1A and the other one is the RF1B. I will show you shortly. And then the viral RNA makes a negative strand RNA as an intermediate. And the negative strand RNA started making more and more and more positive strand RNA. Some of them are subgenomic RNAs, which makes different proteins that helps the virus assemble. And after the assembly, the virus actually takes over some lipid bilayer, something like while going out, the thief steals a jacket, wears the jacket, and goes out so that he's not, he or she is not caught. So the smooth wall vesicle helps them to release out of the system and then they affect the other neighboring viruses. So in all these intermediate states, there are involvement of the host factors at the various stages of the virus life cycle. The genome, as I told you, there is a two RF, uh, RF1A and RF1B, and the third one is actually the structural proteins. These are the non-structural proteins. The structural proteins are the spike, then you have the envelope, the matrix, and the nucleocapsid protein. The majority of the genome is actually occupied by the replicase gene, and then the four structural protein, as I told you, ACMN. And other than that, what you need to know is actually the RF1A and 1B, there is a site which we call ribosomal frame shift site. Because of the ribosome frame shift only, 
the what if one b is produced now these are the things that we need to know because these are the things that can be targeted when we think about countering this virus or designing antivirals now there are a lot of stories started coming out in the last year that where did we get it suddenly this one people started saying well it, it, it is we got it from bat some people started talking about it is from pangolin now actually if you really look at their genome and the virus isolated from pangolin bat and human you can see there is more similarity of the bat and the human coronaviruses with the pangolin derivative not only that there is one more evidence was the five key amino acid in the ac2 receptor binding domain or the rbd in the spike protein is actually conserved between the human and the pangolin than the bat and there was a third evidence that there is a potential furin recognition motif the furin cleavage helps this uh, protein to bind more uh, or expose more towards the receptor ac2 and we found that actually in the human what happened the pangolin and the bat did not have that furin cleavage uh, motif but that is actually came out because of the mutation and now it has more affinity towards the ac2 receptor and that's how maybe perhaps it is more infective in the human compared to what it was showing in the bat or in the pangolin so there was 91% identity with the pangolin five key amino acids in the receptor binding domain consistent between the pangolin and the sars coronavirus 2 which affects human and only sars coronavirus 2 contains a potential cleavage site for the furin proteases and the thing is the host factor plays a role so what we believe that from bat it has come and infected pangolin and from pangolin because of you know there are stories that because of the live market and the meat shops and other things it has come to human and from human because of the droplet spreading this has infected more and more human but more scary was at some point last year it was showing that it started jumping the species and there are reports of cat getting infected or tigers getting infected that did not really happen so much fortunately so around last year april may we started looking at the sequences when people started talking about the pangolin lineage or bat lineage or you know where from we got it we try to do a very very focused study very small number we isolated we actually got it from uh, west bengal and we actually collaborated with the national uh, cholera institute national uh, institute of cholera and enteric diseases niset and in this institute with dr uh, mamuka chawla sarkar and dr santa dotto who is the director they generously gave us samples and we sequenced and we found actually there are mutations happening at that time in april may and we reported we published it in in in, in a quickly in a journal of bioscience uh, which comes out from indian academy of science and we reported we can see a mutations called d614g this is as early as when people didn't know that d614g could be rampant and we also showed that how this mutation can actually contribute to the conformational alterations not only that we showed there are mutations we are seeing in the nucleocapsid in the positions 203 and 204 and because of that there are some micro rna binding sites that might be altered and that's how probably the virus getting an advantage to have more infectivity and infecting more and more human people so when we published this government of india actually particularly this time it was department of biotechnology because i'm heading this national institute of biomedical genomics which is a dbt institute autonomous institute under the aegis of the department of biotechnology so they asked us why didn't you just sequence thousands you know so around may june we pick up this uh, pan india thousand sars cov2 genome sequencing i was coordinating with along with me we had professor arindam mitra and dr nidhan biswas at an ibmg we had uh, four others dbt centers from ils bhubaneswar cdfd hyderabad nccs pune and instem ncbs in tangalo and we all came forward collected samples from all over india all these yellow spots are the places where from we collected samples samples were collected then rnas were isolated and these rnas were sequenced in all these five different places and we actually found 
that if you see between March, April, May, and June, how the mutations are actually changing. You can see the original was the Wuhan type, that was more in the March. Then in April, you can see it's not much change, but you can see there are other mutations coming, the B4, A3, and A2, A2, A strain. And by June, you can see all of them disappeared. It's only the A2A, which is actually D614D that we reported, I told you, actually came out in June, and it's actually overcast and completely overshadowed all other existing strains. Then we extrapolated into West Bengal, Orissa, Karnataka, Telangana, Maharashtra, Uttarakhand, Haryana, and Delhi, and we show that how East, South, West, and North, the mutations variations are different. So as I was telling in the beginning, the virus infects or tries to infect everybody. But the challenge that it faces is different from individual. Individuals are different in different zones. The southern zone individuals might have a different resistivity or a different host determinant compared to east or to the west or north. So that's essentially we tried to address it. And we showed within the different zones, you can see how the 20A 20B, we are actually more in the northern India, more in actually you can see the green bar is the 20A, which is the first one, which is not the, uh, uh, and, and you can see this is north and east and south and west actually behave similarly. So we try to see, this is essentially uh, the picture and the mutation, if it happens in one zone, it quickly spreads to all over. So this is again, uh, June, July of last year. Then, you know, all of us have seen that the virus, titer, uh, virus infection gone down. People thought that we have got rid of our enemy. When we started doing little relaxation, that time there is a news that there is mutations happening in other countries being reported. And government of India again called me and said, is it possible now you can have a program in place? And they made Indian SARS-CoV-2 Genome Consortium to find out initially that whether are we having in India some of the foreign strains that are being reported. At that time in England, if you remember, there was a, I don't remember, there was a tournament going on. They stopped it because of the infection. And, you know, people have a very, very fearful events in London and in and some of the Kent and in some of those uh, UK area. And they showed that they're actually seeing a particular variant of the virus, and we tried to restrict that. We actually made, again, I was coordinating, I'm still coordinating this in SACOG in India, which is comprises of 10 different centers. NIBMG is from Kalyani, from West Bengal, ILS Bhuvaneshwar, NCCS is in Pune, uh, National Institute of Virology, which is an ICMR Institute in Pune. This is first time, this for the professors, first time India has made a consortium where all the funding agencies, CSIR, DST, DBT, Ministry of Health, everybody came forward and we say that we forget about our boundary. We have a unique consortium to work together and come out with a solution to find out what is the variance that is happening. Can we really protect our population from this infection to this variant strain? So we jointly established this INSACOG to monitor the genomic variations in the uh, SARS-CoV-2 and the epidemiological and clinical correlations and find out if you see a mutation, whether that will have any impact in the pathogenicity or not. So this was actually taken off and uh, this is sometimes in Christmas time, we started looking at the mutations in, in India. We were re uh, religiously testing all the international traveler and trying to monitor whether are we getting the same strain as the UK is reporting while we are talking about that, there was a news that South Africa has developed one mutation. Then there was a mutation reported in Brazil, not mutation, multiple mutations, a variant reported in Brazil. Then there was again a Kent variant. Then there was a California variant. And all this time we were actually trying to check, are we getting any unique variant, which is only found in India, but not anywhere else. And then we found sometimes in, in the early this year, that there is a new Indian variant. Originally, we used to call double double mutant uh, just because of these two mutations, L452R and E484Q. Both of them actually contribute to the immune escape. 
remember we are already exposed to the virus from last year but looks like people were still getting reinfected because of these mutations maybe they are able to escape the neutralizing antibody that have been already produced in the host so essentially we try to analyze those in depth and try to find out what is the modulation so i'll just briefly tell you that is a huge network which has been working on now last 3 4 months uh, officially we have uh, you know every districts i'm sure we sequence actually from jhargam as well the, the samples come to the regional uh, surveillance officer from there it comes to the regional sequencing laboratory like in here we have the nibmg and this 10 across laboratories across india we have 10 laboratories the sequences are done they are sent it to the national center for disease control and then they are actually analyzed and then we share this informations in the public database which is called jisaid and then we also share with the public uh, in the bulletin and in the newspaper that there is a variant outbreak or something of that sort the sequences are all mirrored at two places two portal nibmg and the igib portal and the virus that we get uh, isolated we try to save them for biology and for the characterization of the virus whether it is really more virulent less virulent more severe less severe all these experiments we try to do it in four different centers rcb in faridabad nib pune ils bhubaneswar and ccmb in hyderabad now all these things were going on one thing i want to clarify to you people because you get so much of whatsapp university training i just wanted to alert you that everything that we get a mutation you don't have to worry about mutation will happen in rna virus the first slide i showed you it is no surprise so we call it if something interesting we find out we call it it's a variant of interest a variant with specific genetic markers that have been associated with the changes in the receptor binding reduced neutralization by the antibodies generated against the previous infection as i was referring or reduce efficacy to the treatment potential diagnostic impact means we are somehow missing to detect or predicted increase in the transmissibility that means it is more infective or it have a decrease or increase in disease severity we call it as a variant of interest but then variant of concern is something where there is an evidence these are all predictive when there is an evidence yes there is an increase in the transmissibility there is a sufficient evidence that it has a severity issue sufficient evidence to believe that it has significant reduction in the neutralization by the antibodies generated during previous infection or vaccination then only we call it as a variant of concern remember all this double mutant or this our delta variant that we call it now is just uh, actually turned as a variant of concern very recently not in the time when it was actually reported. when a variant of interest comes out people starts working on it try to have a uh, epidemiological and clinical correlation established to make a case that this variant is the reason behind this surge this variant is reason behind this increased severity or morbidity in cases of the patient then only we call it as a variant of concern or voc and there are variant of high consequences which actually has a clear evidence that prevention measures or medical counter measures have significantly reduced effectiveness against this variation variant of high consequences then we really put an alert and say that this particular mutant we have to be extremely extremely careful so far fortunately we have mutant that we are talking about are the variant of concern like the uk variant the south african variant the brazilian variant or even the indian variant now they made it easy they named it as alpha beta gamma and now the indian variant is called delta and now within delta also now they started making a kappa and all these things they will go on like this and the key mutations that we keep on looking so we sequence then we look for the key mutations why they are key mutations there are now evidences mostly predictive and computational modeling but some experimental evidence to show that these mutations can have a consequence in the changes in the conformation of the spike protein so that it has an altered affinity towards the receptor in the host and that it might have a bearing with the more infective or less infective to a particular human host 
so that's basically we call so you have to remember all strains are variants but all variants are not strains often you will see in the newspaper they mix up the strains and the variants but you should not mix it up and we should not mix up between the variant of interest and the variant of concern and variant of high consequences what we look for is again it's something like this colored a uh, boxes if you look at it when you have a uh, mutations showing up it shows in actually white then it actually intensifies its color and when it is established means like 100% it becomes a purple color you can see the Brazil, uh, the uk variant 117 there were some of the mutations were in the purple color then in the 617 or 351 maybe south african variant you see some of those mutations are conserved but there are different mutations showing up but 617 that we call double mutant we have uh, you know first we noticed in the maharashtra then in bengal now in delhi karnataka and at this moment it's almost everywhere the 617 has e484q but actually e450 uh, 484r was actually more dangerous it becomes e484 q in the indian strains but we had the l452 r from south africa and we had 681 r from another uh, california variant which actually made it more infective at this point as far as we think and within the 617 this is a uh, sometimes in uh, maybe in may we reported and now you can see within may and june you can see there are 0.1 0.2 0.3 there are sub variants coming out and you are all the time reading in the newspaper now day before yesterday it says there is a delta plus because there is now one more mutation is finding it out in the background of 617.2 but any mutation should not alarm or alert something like very very dangerous that mutation may or may not sustain i told you in the beginning that virus only allows those mutation to stay back which will help the virus but many mutations the virus find out it is useless that those are actually not naturally selected they are all gone right so what we try to do this genomic surveillance as actually dr tapos and also your principal has mentioned in the beginning there is an urgent need to continue this genomic surveillance so that we know that what is going to come out and if something comes out now we are also getting knowledgeable and trained we can predict and try to see whether that particular state that particular district that particular town should be closely monitored if we find out that a particular variant is slowly slowly building up right it's something like a you know the tornado builds up you can see that so same way is something is blooming there some surge is going to happen in that particular district that particular town if we can monitor it then easily we can contain that infection in that particular place before it spreads all over see from town it comes to the state or uh, to the district from district it becomes state and from the state it becomes nation and now 617.2 is becoming an international event so if i if we can actually identify the enemy where it actually started growing we can actually have a surgical strike and make sure that we get rid of it and that's how we need to have this better understanding of the disease epidemiology the testing strategies clinical severity fortunately all these mutations and the variants doesn't really change the treatment pattern so and testing strategies also so far all these mutations that we have identified are rt pcr positive rt pcr positive means their rna were detected by the available detection kit so lot of newspapers started saying that this variant is escaping the detection if it is escapes the detection how in the first place we could sequence it we couldn't sequence it because we are actually getting the rna which are rt pcr positive then only we sequence so this is essentially the knowledge gap the newspaper and this other media are wrongly advising the public and just spreading the panic that i think is something all of you have to understand there is no point to relax but no point to panic you have to strike a balance between the two be careful but don't panic and so what we are doing this surveillance we are doing at the state at the district level 
and then national at the international level. As I was just referring to you, look at this 617.2, which we call the Delta variant. In January, we could hardly see it. February, we could hardly see it. Look at it in March and in April. These are different colors in the state. It was actually found mostly in Maharashtra. This is the Maharashtra. You can see this. Now, this Maharashtra is now in, all over. Now, you can see Chhattisgarh in Delhi, in West Bengal, and in June, you can see it's almost 90% all over. It's like an India map has come into this 617.2. But before you are seeing, actually it was more a UK variant, which was mostly in different states. Then actually 617 came and replaces this. Uh, and then 617.1 is now replaced by 617.2. So that's how the RNA virus take over uh, one that has a better fitness, virus fitness. This is another representation. One of our colleague, Dr. Nidhan Biswas at NIBMG has made it, like how over the year, 2019, December, to 2020, February, April, June, August, October, December, February, April. So it goes on like this. You can see how these different strains are actually weak time. This is called a time tree or phylogenetic time tree, phylodynamics. Different states and different states are different color of the circles. And you can see that this green circle is in West Bengal and Bihar and Madhya Pradesh. You can see they were actually, this particular variants were actually coming out. And this 617.1 or 617.2, the Delta variant, is started coming out sometimes in February. Before that, we couldn't see it. I mean, one or two here, there are stray cases, but mostly they were coming. And you can see the variant started coming only after October. September, October, you can start seeing all these variants started coming. Before that, it was actually the same Wuhan strain or the D614G, which were actually hovering around in every states, in every districts. And if you really look at in another representation, the VOCs, the different variant of concern. As I told you, in Christmas time or in the early January, New Year time, we are more worried about 117, which is the UK strain, then South African strain, and then 617 strain. And this 617.2 was hardly found in January. Now look at this in May. You have seen that 117 has reduced to almost bare minimum. 617.1 is also reduced to bare minimum. Look at the 617.2, which is the Delta strain is from, uh, this was something like 10% here. It becomes 90% or 80, 80, 85% by May 2021. So alpha, uh, beta, gamma, and delta, and kappa, you can see how they have emerged over the time and try to replace different variants all over the world. Now, how does it really matter? The question is, what this knowledge will help us? The one thing is, we are worried whether this is going to affect our neutralizing antibody. Many of the population are already infected once. Many of the population are already vaccinated. That means their body is already supposed to have antibody against the virus. But even then, if you are worried whether the new variant is going to affect the individual again or not, we need to see where the mutations are happening and where actually the epitopes, means those actually are responsible for making neutralizing antibody in the vaccine or in a, in a real natural infection, we try to map that from a new, this is an article came out from the UK consortium and they showed that actually none of these variants have directly impact on the neutralizing antibody. Some of them are, might have an indirect effect, but so far, interestingly, we haven't seen any variant which will be absolutely resistant to any neutralizing antibody. It has a little impact, little reduction, not, not to the extent that you should start thinking that there is no point taking vaccination. So those are all, again, popular article and popular stories. But the main thing is, it's important to protect yourself and vaccination is the only way to protect yourself. So keep that thing in mind. So just to at a glance, as I told you, 117 or the UK strain uh, actually have the proportion, is it declining stage, as I told you, and 617.2 is keep on increasing, increased testing, quick isolation of that uh, patient, 
prevent crowds and intermingling of people and that's how the lockdown is extended so that we somehow have a restriction in the gathering and the other public places wearing of mask and vaccinations wearing of mask is going to prevent you no matter what the variant comes in the future so if you are wearing mask you are protected so don't worry about the mutations and the emergence of mutant but you do your duty you wear mask that's something the message i would like to convey now how we are handling it in the laboratory so in my lab at iisc also started working on this virus and we made a virus like particle which is called dlp what is virus like particle it's the entire structural protein of the virus but minus the nucleic acids that means it is non infectious it won't be able to replicate or infect but since it has the structural protein like the spike nucleocapsid envelope and the matrix it will behave the three dimensionally like the virus and we are trying to see how this dlp can be used to understand the immunogenicity so if you have a mutation we try to incorporate in the dlp and ask the question does it really affecting the immunogenicity means whether it will be neutralized by the vaccinated sera or not or is it actually having an increased or decreased affinity towards the ac2 receptor whether it will have an increased infectivity or not so this is essentially we are trying to address it in a in a much deeper way and in ibng uh, my group at nibmg also started working on it collectively finally i would like to give you uh, just a glimpse of the vaccines there are a lot of confusion about rna vaccines or you know the subunit vaccines or a full length uh inactivated vaccines which one good which one bad but the bottom line i just want to show you a table again it is a collected it's not my work but you can see the modern mrna vaccine is effective 94.1% efficacy at preventing the severe disease and 14 days post second dose pfizer mrna based vaccine again 94.6% efficacy 7 days post second dose astrazeneca the covid shield we have used 70.4% Uh, for eu variant 81.5% for non eu lineage sputnik the russian vaccine 91.1% co vaccine so far you know the results are still coming out the third phase trial results hasn't come out but interim eff efficacy is actually actually is very very encouraging yeah so finally i would like to show that the this is something came out in the public health england which showed the covid-19 vaccine surveillance report that the first dose and second dose can protect 85 to 90% of the symptomatic disease 85 to 90% infection protection you can get it symptomatic disease means like hospitalization 90 to 95% mortality 95 to 99% and infection is 70 to 90 this is the window that 70 to 90% for the pfizer and the oxford astrazeneca that covid shield actually is something to you need to worry about that there is still some room for the virus to infect so that's how it's important that we keep on actually follow the practice and try to stop the virus at the gate and you wear mask and as i told you we are going through a very very dark time but i believe in positivity i always see at the end of the dark there is an illumination and the light and that's how you can see the illuminated nibmg and that's how we feel that the knowledge of the virus the knowledge of the genome and knowledge of all of us will actually show the light to the world thank you all and thanks for giving me this opportunity i'll be happy to answer your questions thank you thank you sir for such an uh, informative lecture sir you have discussed the difficulties of handling the rna viruses mutation rate in different viruses antigenic shift and their drift hijacking the host factors you have discussed new challenges of corona viruses its genome structural organization and about the indian sars cov2 genomic consortium mutants and different types of variations variant strains and implications of this genomic surveillance for the uh, benefit of the mankind and also at the end you have discussed the different types of vaccines those are available or under the trial process 
thank you sir once again now the session is open for discussion the participants are requested to write down their question at the chat box so that our technical expert they will uh, put up these questions and we will able to convey this to our speaker now i have uh, such questions sir uh, uh, will i uh, shall i uh, convey to it sir sure okay sir the first question uh, from dr shantanu chakraborty sir as you suggested innate immunity may have more effective role in this infection as you have showed mutants actually help the virus to evade antibody mediated immunity don't you think we should target mucosal immunity in the respiratory system more for effective immune clearance of the virus at entry points sir so it, yeah i mean it, it, it's nothing special about the mucosal immunity only i mean it, it, there are different vaccines and they are trying to have different targets but overall any kind of vaccines people are also trying to have a nasal spray as a vaccine so anything which will actually go into the immune system will have so i don't think uh, and at some point because of the mutation is that prashant biswas can you switch off yes sir continue sir so today the virus is infecting the lung in the uh, initial stage but later on it's spreading to other organs as well right so there are reports prashant bishwas you are requested to mute of yourself sir please continue sir right so i think well he is trying to ask question trying to ask question just allow him to ask question so so all i just feel that it, it it is important not only the mucosal immunity any kind of delivery at this moment is welcome for this because if the virus will be in the system so anywhere the immunity can actually give you protections okay next question okay sir next question uh, from uh, dr vidhan chandra samondo my question is uh, we have seen some of the covid patients are symptomatic and some are asymptomatic is this due to variance in genome sequence of the virus or any other reason behind this no see what we have found that uh, the same variant actually is affecting different individuals differently same virus in the same family is infecting you know in some cases symptomatic to father asymptomatic to sister so you can't really say it's the variant it is the genetic get up of that individual the immune setup of that individual which is important more rather than the variant next question from nobonita ghosh how effective the available covid vaccines will be against the mutating strains of sars cov 2 in the long run the uh, you know we have already shown that uh, the vaccines that are now in the horizon actually have multiple epitopes and they are spreaded in different proteins the mutations are not able to escape all of them they might reduce the efficacy to certain extent but it is difficult to think as a virologist that the virus will evolve in such a way that it will bypass all the epitopes but at the same time scientists are also not sitting idle they are also trying to engineer those mutations and making fresh new vaccines along with it if you remember every year the flu vaccines are made and changed looking at the what variant is coming in that particular strain we don't know maybe in future we we'll probably try to have this booster dose with a different variant if necessary but at this moment this is not an alarm so next question from the same participant is there any correlation between increased infectivity with mortality of the mutant varieties no so the increased infectivity is evidenced 
but increased mortality uh, we can't really directly i i get these questions from the news readers and other uh, reporters but the thing is you have to also remember how the health is managed a lot of times earlier people used to be detected and immediately isolated and hospitalized last year but this year they are advised to stay at home and then take care of you because the symptoms is not so severe and by the time they are reaching to the hospitals it has advanced to a level which is unmanageable in certain individuals not all those cases we are actually having mortality so we can't really say it's attribute that it is only for the variant yes variant can also be different but it's also how we are managing our own health so next question from rahul jana as we uh, know that the mutation rate is very slow but how these rna viruses get mutated very fast so that's i'm saying the rna viruses mutation rate is high that's what i showed in the first slide because they don't have the proof reading or the error prone rna dependent rna polymer uh next question sir from uh priyanshu priyanshu devnath if vaccination gap is increased as in case of the covid shield between first and second dose it increases the efficiency but also increases the chance of mutations and if gap is kept 28 days efficiency is lesser sir which should be given priority the efficiency or vaccinating more people so definitely vaccinated more people is uh, priority because you know if you can actually vaccinate the full population you can see that how we got rid of polio right that's definitely the agenda number 1 but agenda number 2 this is also not correct totally that if you have a, a difference distance between 8 weeks to 10 weeks it's going to completely uh, take out the vaccine efficacy that's not the case that people are thinking it will still protect Okay, sir. Next question for Jyoti Smita, sir. What do you think about the modern microbial trend? What is that? <laughs> uh, I don't know, sir. She asked, uh, "What do you think about the modern microbial trend?" Uh, Means like uh, they they are prone to mutations. If if you say so that it is prone to mutations or drug resistance, I would say that you know it's it's the modern life. is something pushing them to mutate fast a the question environmental from pressure. environmental yes. pressure it's the one that they are saying she is trying to say mm. okay another question from anupam mondol uh, does there any genetical process by which uh, we can decrease the high mutation rate of rna virus we have to train the virus that if you copy to copy correctly no so uh, a question from rk his is uh, his uh, name is not uh, clear cool. anyway uh, we know rna viruses have the tendency to mutate quickly so the high mutation rate may cause the generation of new type of viruses what will we call these new types mutated viruses new variants or new species of virus it depends on the the level of mutation i showed you that it can end up with a new virus if they exchange the genome like the way recombination can happen it can have a uh, you know a recombination insertion lot of things can happen so possibilities are there for all another question from our student uh, shujo pai if a corona patient is reinfected with a mutant strain uh, is his immune system will able to protect him if yes then how no so this is actually i was just trying to say let's say if you are making 100 antibodies now all 100 antibodies are not ineffective in a mutant maybe 3 or 4 are ineffective so why, there is no reason to believe that other 97 won't be able to challenge the virus so even if it happens the reinfection cases it is actually mild so far and manageable we are just saying there is a chance of 10 to 20% people getting reinfected 
but they, they are not expected to be hospitalized. It should be mild and restricted. Next question, sir, from uh, Roman Nagasipam. What could be the possible intermediate host of COVID-2019? So that's basically I told you the intermediate host is pangolin. Bat or pangolin, there is a debate, but uh, results shows more close to pangolin. Uh, Shoumen Shekhar Ghosh asking that, uh, those you got infected once, they already have the antibodies, then do they need both the doses or a single dose will be sufficient? No, actually this is, uh, the doctors can answer better, but they are still advised to wait for two months and then take the booster dose. Uh, last question, sir, uh, from Jagdish. Has the coronavirus disease... Because I will just elaborate, I will elaborate a little more. Yes, See, natural infection antibody may not be as much as we use a recombinant vaccine or a protein. So this is much more robust. So to have a robust antigenic response is better to have the booster dose. Yeah. Uh, sir, last question from Jagdish. Has the coronavirus disease been detected in other body fluid like urine or stool? So there are uh, some reports here and there, it all depends on at what uh, time point. So at a later stage when it infects every organ, so it might come out into the body fluids. But otherwise it is not known at this moment that it spreads through the body fluid. It's more an oropharyngeal route. Okay, uh, I don't find uh, any more questions. So uh, I would request, uh, I once again thank you, sir, for such an uh, elaborate discussion. It is very much informative for us. Uh, we are uh, uh, able to know the current positions of the different kinds of vaccines and different strains. Those are emerging uh, in due course. Now uh, I would request uh, Dr. Rahul Kumar Dotto, head of our department, to uh, give away the vote of thanks. Sir, are you here, sir? Yes, I'm here. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you, Shundir. Good afternoon, everybody. It is a custom to deliver a vote of thanks, which is very, very customary and I think after such a nice webinar, it is really a very much artifact. However, I express my sincere thanks and gratitude to our respected principal, sir, Dr. Devnarayan Rai, for not only giving permission to this webinar, but also for his endeavor to initiate the webinar and for all the suggestions, inspirations, and encouragement. The college is highly obliged to Department of Higher Education, Government of West Bengal in this context, being a government college. We are equally grateful to Department of Biotechnology, Government of India for offering diabetes star college scheme to Jhargram Raj College so that we are able to conduct this webinar. In today's webinar, we are very lucky to have our distinguished speaker, Professor Shomitra Dash, Sir, Sir Jagadish Chandra Boshu, National Fellow and Director of National Institute of Biomedical Genomics. And we have really had an excellent deliberation regarding genomics of SARS CoV 2. And despite his busy schedule, he has spent his valuable time. For this, we express our sincere thanks and gratitude to him. I express my thanks to all the faculty members of Jhargram Raj College and college administrative staff members. And special thanks are due to Dr. Tapush Kumar Audaldar, Assistant Professor of Chemistry, Jhargram Raj College, who is the DBT coordinator of the college also for his enthusiasm and he has tried 
many things including contact with our respective speakers sir and made most of the arrangements thank you so much and with this i would also like to take the opportunity to thank you and congratulate my colleagues especially the committee members of this organizing committee including dr krishnendu sinha sri sanjeev kumar dash mohammad shoriful islam sri shourab baroi dr koushik sen and srimati sanjita pan the success of a seminar or webinar is undoubtedly associated with the participants and we find that more than 230 participants have taken participation in this webinar including principals of different colleges uh, we have found uh, professor shubhid dasgupta we have found professor uh, dr shantanu chakraborty dr hori prasad sarkar dr obhijit dutt principals of different colleges uh, i am not knowing uh, whether other principals are present were present or not however special thanks are due to all of them all the principals and scientists from different institutes as well as all the officers and teachers from different colleges universities even some schools some headmasters and headmistresses have also taken uh, part in the webinar i should not uh, uh i should not thank our student but uh, their participation lot but not the least should be uh, very much appreciated thank you sir if uh, your time permits i have few request tell me because the session is officially over right actually uh, uh, i would like to you know request you to uh, give some message for our students so that they can cope up with that in pandemic situation here yeah. uh, uh, the <clears throat> message is essentially as i told you that we are going through a hard time and uh, but you know you have to look for the positivity now uh, in last one year what we have learned that how you can explore the virtual world which we never thought of i think we have gained almost 10 years of our knowledge of handling this computer or this uh, the video conferencing or this webinar this where it wouldn't have happened in next 10 years unless this has happened right so if you look at the positive thing i don't think uh, many of you unless you have taken some national exams are not familiar with the online teaching or online uh, online coaching or online giving examinations those things we have learned now you can easily have a lecture from mit which was very difficult to have it before so you know these are the positive thing and when you are actually i keep telling my students that when you are quarantine it's something like the monsoon has come here when it rains you don't go out but the rain stops and immediately the sun comes you go get your things done come back again it starts raining our situation is just like a monsoon now we have a window now i think by end of june to all expectations looks like by july it will come down but then again if it comes back before that yeah. you try to make as, as much as you can you try to explore as much as you can in that time okay so it's very important that make hay when the sun shine that's precisely is happening so you use the opportunity when you are stuck at home you explore to the best possibility that what all things internationally you can actually achieve it by enrolling registering to different courses short term lectures webinars everything i think those were not possible before they were all actually charging but these are now free actually i now keep meeting all this in, i was just telling people i was traveling so much in 2019 and yes, it's so less but if you just see my seminars and how many uh, meetings i have attended it's almost 10 times what i did in 
so it has increased your ability to do more sitting in one desktop so this is something positive now so any time life you will have a struggle but you should not get frustrated challenge will come but you have to handle the challenges okay so that's basically the way of looking at the life you know it's very hard to accept when you lose somebody very near and dear or you know some uh, friends some colleagues some family members we are actually we never imagine this will happen but we have to go through it we don't have any option at this moment but i'm just saying what we can do best is don't get sick yourself don't put your family members in danger just taking extra risk so try to avoid gatherings try to avoid which can be avoided and at least you protect yourself if you do that i think uh, you know we have the ability uh, we can definitely overcome the situation we will over the overcome the situation okay but uh, uh, as i am saying you try to utilize if you have a gap i don't know what is the situation in jhargaon now whether the colleges are open or they are closed but if they are closed then as we are saying all these teachers are available over uh, internet you can try to get their classes have their special training have interactions you explore to the extent that is possible that's the positivity okay so uh, and you know just getting depressed is not going to help you to win over yeah thank you sir my uh, second request to you that we are you know planning to send some of our faculty members and student to your institute for some kind of training as a part of dbt program So how it is possible, sir? No, no, it is possible, but only thing is at this moment I am saying yes, yes, that is. If yes. the lockdown is over and then uh, we started entertaining visitor, we'll definitely we have programs where people come and uh, particularly we have now this outreach uh, program where we train them genomics, we do workshops. Those are the chances. Other than that, we also have summer training program. People can come and then work for. little longer time stay in the hostel and then uh, in the campus and then they will be trained so those are all possible but the only thing is uh, we have to wait for the sunshine <laughs> sir my last request please make a visit to jhargaon raj college and also jhargaon definitely definitely i will be i will be happy to do that i told you that i will come in january but it didn't happen but let's hope that we'll have a scope and if you get to see anybody in 1977 madhyamik batch let me know in kki I'll be happy to get back my friends. Definitely. Actually, we are trying to form an alumni, uh, but due to that situation, we are not. I know, know it didn't uh, happen. Uh, yes. You know. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I can see Dr. Hari Prasad Sarkar. I know you. How are you, Dr. Hari? Is he is there? I can see his picture. Uh, he is from. Uh, he is in Medinipur College. He is he is principal of Godbeta College, sir. Godbeta College, right, right, right. Because his brother is my friend, Devi Prasad Sarkar. Right, uh, Devi Prasad Sarkar. <laughs> he, all right, uh, all right. Nice Papa interacting Sir, with you. Professor Devi, hmm? Professor Devi Prasad Sarkar has already uh, delivered a topic in okay. our uh, webinar uh, last see, year. I see. He has already done. Pramitra. Yeah. Ah. Chintamani. That's what I was asking you. You are Hari. Ah, ah, Hari. Good, good. good. <laughs> How are you? Ah, fine. Okay, okay. fine. Good, hello. Good, hello. I am here. Uh, Thank uh, you. Good, good discussion. On a few things, hello. Hello, lagya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank fine. You. Very fine. Thank you. How are you? Hello, thank you. Ah, no sir. Abhinav, hello, thank you, sir. No sir. Hello, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at the end of our with this uh, thanks tapos for uh, conducting the end moment and requesting some of the queries uh, and some of the appeals to uh, professor das uh, thank you principal sir and different dignitaries from different institutions and college uh, with this i would like to end this session thank you thank you thanks, thanks to all thanks thanks to all thank you so much sir